Today we're going to be talking about symbiotic relationships. Symbiotic relationships occur in virtually every ecosystem and they are really important for every ecosystem. Um, because without them, um, organisms aren't going to be able to get the materials, the resources, um, a lot of the things that they need come from the benefit of these symbiotic relationships. So we're going to be talking about the big three today. Uh, but before we do that, we'll go ahead and define what it means to have a symbiotic relationship. And it is any relationship. in which two species live closely together and it's it's pretty uh, it's a pretty broad definition uh, because there's a couple different ways that they can interact with one another um, some positive some negative and some neutral so we're gonna look at those today but the one key thing to take away from this is they have to be members of two different species otherwise it doesn't qualify as symbiosis. So, for example, if it were um, two rabbits of the same species and they were in some way or another interacting, that is not symbiosis. It would have to be a rabbit and a squirrel um, somehow interacting with one another. Now, it could be, you know, technically two, mem two different species of squirrel um, interacting with one another, but a lot of times members of different species really don't want to interact with one another you know in a lot of in a lot of situations if i'm a member of one species and you're a member of another um we don't have a lot in common so we're not hanging out right we're, you know maybe this one's trying to eat that one or vice versa so in a lot of these situations you know members of other species they just kind of ignore one another um you know and kind of go about their business and you got to think of that in terms of you know as you as a human right um you may have like a pet or something like that that you intera interact with, but outside of a pet, you don't have a lot of interaction with um, organisms. You know, you're not going out into the woods and, you know, squirrels are harvesting acorns for you or anything like that. You know, there's other species that you're interacting with, but you don't really kind of forge uh, relationships with those organisms. So other species are the same way. They're not, you know, if they're not gaining something from it. And a lot of what you'll see in these as we go through these, you'll see that some of these are simply unintentional. Um, a lot of them are unintentional. These, these organisms don't have a desire to help one another. It's just, I'm gonna do my thing and you're gonna do your thing. And it just so happens that those two things, you know, help us or help you or whatever the case may be. So the first one we're gonna look at is what's called mutualism. Mutualism is where both species in the relationship benefit. So I call this a win-win. Okay. And if you look at the term mutualism, I always try to remind my students mutual. It is mutually beneficial. Okay. It is, it is good for both of these. So if I were to give you a real life example, be something along the lines of maybe, um, you have a ticket to uh, a concert, right? And you really want to go to that concert and turns out that's this you got this concert you bought this ticket and it turns out it's the same night as your grandparents anniversary party and you just can't go okay but you got the ticket um, and you have a friend who really wants to go to the concert and they missed out on buying the ticket but it just so happens that they happen to have an extra cell phone they bought a cell phone and it came with a buy one get one free and your cell phone breaks you can't go to the concert, you're out of a cell phone. They really want to go to the concert, they have an extra cell phone. You can easily reach a mutually beneficial agreement, right? They give you the cell phone, you give them the ticket, both of you walk away happy, right? It's mutually beneficial. And that's what's happening in nature. Like I said though, in most of these scenarios, it's not a desire to make the other person happy or it's not a desire to come to an agreement. It's simply two organisms doing what they do, and it just so happens that they both benefit. So there's lots of different relationships um, in nature of mutualism, and we're going to look at some of the big ones. Um, probably one of the most um, referred to cases of mutualism is the relationship that exists between pollinators and flowers. Okay? 
flowers need to be pollinated. Okay, and they have to be pollinated in order to um, produce seeds. So if we're looking at a flower, draw, try to draw a little tulip here. Okay, this is our flower. Um, and this flower is going to do everything that it can to attract pollinators. It's brightly colored, it smells good, but the real key is this flower is going to produce nectar. Okay. Nectar is sweet and it is fuel for a lot of different organisms. Um, there are birds that eat nectar, there are bees that eat nectar, there are butterflies and moths that uh, consume nectar. So there's a lot of different things after this nectar. So they come to this flower wanting to pick up the nectar. But what happens is, in addition to nectar, these flowers have these little parts that stick up and attach to these little parts is something called pollen. Okay, Pollen is the male reproductive cell of a flower. So when the bee comes in and says, oh boy, free food, I can't wait. Okay, If you've ever looked at a bee up close, one thing you'll notice is they're kind of fuzzy. Right? Now maybe you said, I don't want to get close to a bee, but if you've ever had the opportunity to look at one, um, you'll see that a bee is fuzzy. So when this bee buzzes along and it lands on this flower, it's going to get some nectar, but it's also going to inadvertently, this pollen is going to stick to that fuzzy little body of the bee. And that way, when this bee buzzes off and goes to another flower to get more nectar, that pollen that he collected on flower A will get transferred to flower B. Okay, So that's how pollination happens. And again, it's completely inadvertent. The bee wasn't like, oh, got to go get some pollen and help these plants out. It's just trying to get a meal. Okay, so um, you know this bee wants the nectar, wants the food. In the process, picks up pollen, transfers pollen from flower A to flower B, and when this flower produces seeds, it is now producing seeds that are a combination of those two flowers. Sexual reproduction has taken place, which is what the plant wanted all along. Plants are really sneaky. We don't give them a lot of credit, but plants are really sneaky in getting other organisms to kind of do their bidding. Um, so that's probably the most classic example of mutualism. Another example uh, would be cleaner fish. Cleaner fish are small little fish that will swim inside the mouths of larger fish. Um, especially like sharks and things like that, and they will clean between those sharks' teeth. So there's kind of an unspoken agreement there. Uh, the shark will open its mouth and agree not to eat the, the fish because it's just a little teeny tiny fish, right? And so the shark to that, it would be even less than a snack. So that fish will actually go inside the shark's mouth and um, eat kind of leftover pieces of meat and things like that that may be stuck between its teeth. So that keeps its uh, teeth nice and healthy and in return um, that cleaner fish gets a meal. So, And this happens not just with cleaner fish, but you also see sometimes birds that will ride on the back of animals like water buffalo and those types of things. They'll actually dig into the animal's back and dig out parasites and things like that. So they'll dig those out, eat them, it, they get a meal, and it keeps the other animals parasite free. Uh, another example that I want to give here, because I want to use it in um, one of my uh, other types, is uh, imagine a squirrel living in an oak tree. Okay, So as we know, an oak tree produces acorns. So when a squirrel lives in an oak tree, it gets um, a place to live. And it can you know, make its little nest there somewhere in the tree. While it's living in that tree, it's also going to be gathering up acorns because the acorns are going to be falling all around. Um, that... Um, squirrel is going to take those acorns and bury them everywhere. It's going to put some in a tree, it's going to bury some underground, and it's going to consume and, and pick up so many acorns, it has no idea where it left them all. They, don't, they have some pretty simple brains. So in, in the process of living in the tree, they also spread those seeds all over the place. So squirrel gets a place to live, the tree gets its seeds spread all around. And again, remember that because we're going to talk about it again on our next example, which is called commensalism. Okay, so unlike mutualism, commensalism is where one of the species in this relationship benefits and the other is completely unaffected. Or sometimes we say the other is neither helped nor harmed. So there's no good, there's no bad, it's just kind of neutral. It's a neutral interaction. Um, the most classic example that's always used here are barnacles 
and the whales that they attach themselves to. So if you've ever seen a video or an up-close image of a whale, you'll see that it has these bumpy little um, kind of suction things uh, or little organisms suction cup to it. Now they don't suction cup and they don't leach anything from the whale. They're not stealing blood. They're not ticks or fleas or anything like that. They're simply just kind of suction cup to the underside of the whale. Um, the reason they do that is barnacles are filter feeders. So they swim through the water attached to the whale and they pass lots and lots of water through their body and as they do they pull out little bits and pieces little uh, of food and that's how they feed now if they're not attached to a whale they have a really tough time moving themselves through the water they're kind of at the mercy of the current they just kind of float around so they'll float around and then until they come into contact with one of these larger organisms they'll suction cup themselves to it and then they just kind of hitch a ride for the rest of the time um, they've also discovered now this would not be symbiosis because the other uh, thing involved in this is not an organism but they've also involved that ships are really good for moving them around the ocean. So barnacles will attach themselves to the underside of ships and that's why periodically you have to pull the ships and then clean them um, to get all the barnacles off so that it doesn't affect the way the ship moves through the water. But So uh, other relationships uh, were commensalism. We'll get back to that squirrel and tree example. If a squirrel lives in a tree um, that is not an oak tree, let's say it's an elm tree, and the squirrel has no interest in those uh, seeds, then now it becomes commensalism because the squirrel is getting a place to live, the tree is not being harmed because the squirrel is not really harming it by living there, and it is not spreading its seeds. So there's no good, no bad for the tree. It now becomes commensalism. So if you ever see that, you have to be careful and read the whole example because you can't just automatically jump and say, oh, squirrel in a tree. It's got to be mutualism because um, if it's not a tree where it's spreading seeds, then it becomes commensalism. The last type of symbio uh, symbiotic relationships is called parasitism. And in parasitism, this is the only one of the three um, where we have a negative impact. So one organism is going to benefit and the other is going to be negatively impacted. Um, and so this is the type of relationship we see between a, a deer and a tick. Um, a flea and its host, um, a leech and its host. So the organism that's doing the harm and, and, and receiving the benefit is the parasite and the organism that is being harmed is the host. Uh, the trick to a good parasitic relationship is being able to live on your host or within your host and not be detected. Um, you know, a lot of, and you also don't, you want to make sure that you don't eliminate your host because if I'm a leech and I just take so much blood from my host that the host dies, well, I'm dead too, right? So there's kind of finding that balance of, you know, you got to take enough nutrients to stay alive, but you can't take so many that you kill your host because once your host is dead, then that's your meal ticket and you don't have anything else to eat. So, um, and there are some plants that, um, that are capable of this. We have parasitic plants. Um, it's usually plants that can't photosynthesize because, you know, what's the point in, you know, being a parasitic plant if you can get your energy from the sun? Most of the plants that are parasitic, they cannot photosynthesize. And so they kind of dig into another plant that can and steal nutrients and water and those types of things. So again, the big three that we've discussed today are mutualism, where both species benefit, commensalism, where we have one species benefit and the other being unaffected, and parasitism, where we have one species benefiting and the other member of that relationship is being harmed.